about a no-win deal, you know. Okay, so here's what it's like to be me. This is a true story. So last week, I'm at this writer's conference in Chautauqua, and who do I follow but Lee K. Abbott, who's a hilarious bastard. <laughs> and then this week, who do I follow but Bruce Smith, who I was on the Pulitzer board when he was a finalist and immediately began trying to hire him and make him our own. And um, this seems like a, just a double-barrel ass-whipping right now <laughs> to come second here. But, you know, I want to I thank Matt Leone. Um, who, you know, isn't just gracious to everyone, but really extends himself to be so warm. There's no one who is not a recipient of that. And I just, you know, I'd like you guys to give my. <laughs> really, we're so lucky. So I'm a Catholic with a capital C, albeit not the Pope's favorite Catholic, I'm sure. <laughs> Actually, right before I came here, Father Kate called me, the guy who baptized me. And every time he calls me, he says, are you still Catholic? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, what, you think it didn't take? <laughs> but he was calling me about the Sports Illustrated thing, so anyway. Um, this is a poem in which I speculate about Jesus having had a wife. And I don't imagine for him this kind of you know, beatific uh, Mary or sort of recanted Mary Magdalene, but a real sinner. <laughs> Somebody who's dark and is interested in fly show. So, <laughs> this is called The Wife of Jesus Speaks. <laughs> Ours was the first inch of time. The word passion hadn't yet been coined, and I'd not yet watched my beloved laid out to butchery and worship as a virgin, son of a virgin even. This was before the Roman bastards hammered his arms wide as for some permanent embrace. Before the apostles paid me to lie, he never shuddered to death in my arms. I never feasted on his flesh that now feeds any open mouth. And inside me, he never released with a shudder, the starry firmaments, and enough unborn creatures to fill an ark, all in a salty milk. His God gave us no child. And even the books of salvation have not seen fit to save me. Not the first woman a great man denied knowing. I, s I said no back for eternity, with a rope slung over a tree branch, I put my face inside a zero, and with a single step, clicked off his world's racket. Now my ghost head bends sharp to one side, as in permanent awe. When he came down to hell and held out that pale hand for rescue, I turned my back, the snap vertebra like a smashed pearl. So my soul went unharrowed. In these rosy caverns, you worship what you want. I have chosen that time in time's initial measure, history's virgin parchment, when with his hard stalk of flesh inside me, I was unripped. Before me, I hold no other god. I keep waiting for the, you know, Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> Come loping in. I'm mostly going to read poems. <laughs> Lee and I talked yesterday about this Guggenheim of mine, which I'm going to mention about nine times, because I applied for the Guggenheim 18 times, 18 times, and finally got one. And, I, and Lee said, I never applied. I applied 17 times, and I quit. And I said, Lee, I applied 18. He's like, that's it. <laughs> so anyway, you've got to wear the bastards down. I did the same thing to the New Yorker. Um, Bruce bitches that he doesn't get published in The New Yorker. But of course, I wasn't a finalist for the Pulitzer or the National Book Award, but who's noticing? But, um, so in this poem I wrote about my 16-year-old son, I changed one of the names of my son's moron friends <laughs> to Bruce. <laughs> So he has appeared in The New Yorker. 
<laughs> albeit saying something incredibly stupid. So. A blessing from my 16 years son. I have this son who assembled inside me during Hurricane Gloria. In a flash, he appeared in a tiny blaze. Outside, pines toppled, phone lines snapped and hissed like cobras. Inside, he was a raw pearl, microscopic, luminous. Look at the muscled obelisk of him now, pawing through the icebox for more grapes. <laughs> Sixteen years and not a bone broken, nor single stitch. By his age, I was marked more ways and small. He's a slouching six foot three with implausible blue eyes which settle on the pages of Emerson's self-reliance with profound belligerence. A girl with a navel ring could make his cell, cell phone go buzz. Or an afro boy leaning on a mop at Taco Bell. Creatures strange to me as dragons or eels. Balanced on a kitchen stool, each gives counsel, arcane as any oracles. Bruce claims school is harshing my mellow. <laughs> Joe longs to date a tattooed girl because he wants a woman willing to do stuff she'll regret. <laughs> They've come to lead my son into his broadening spiral. Someday soon, the tether will snap. I birthed my own mom into oblivion. The night my son smashed the car fender, then rode home in the rain-streaked cop car, he asked, did you and dad screw up this much? He'd let me tuck him in, my grandmother's qu wedding quilt from 1912 drawn to his goateed chin. Don't blame us, I said. You're your own idiot now. <laughs> At which he grinned. The cop said the girl in the crimped Chevy took it hard. He'd found my son awkwardly holding her in the canted headlights where he draped his own coat over her shaking shoulders. My fault, he confessed right off. Nice kid, said the cop. So you are in the New Yorker, honey. Um, I'm reading a lot of poems here, but I don't want to read the same one over and over. Okay, another. How about another Catholic poem? Yeah. <laughs> Disgraceland. <laughs> I wanted to call my I wanted to call my um, book Disgraceland, but there's no Elvis in it, and so I knew it was wrong. Um, I really, I mean, I, this priest I just talked to, the guy who baptized me, is not a renegade, not an outlaw, nothing. He's just a little sort of parish priest who's one of those guys who is so spiritually advanced that he breaks rules in these marvelous kind of bewildered ways.